Right, and what would you, I, I hope that you'll participate. It's a small, intimate crowd, so I want you to talk to me. I am a real estate agent, over 38 years of selling houses. So at the end of the day, we're all the same, no difference. Number of transactions doesn't make you a better or lesser person. All it does is dictate certain things that you will be doing that other people may not be doing. So when we do, I've been doing a class called Finish Strong. I've already done the class Finish Strong in the month of August six times, all right? So we're doing a little abbreviated version here. I can do a two, three, four hour or all day version, but we're gonna do an abbreviated one hour version and give you an idea of why we can change our mindset and how such that between now and December 31st, we can possibly do more transactions than we've done from January 1st till now, or do as much as we've done in a year between now and the end of the year. And, there's, and it's really actually not that difficult to do, and most of it has to do with what's going on up here. Uh, so that's the, what we're going to discuss, and we're gonna bring it about by actually having you participate with me as we talk about it. So remember what I said, I've been selling real estate for over 38 years, the actual act of selling real estate is still a challenge. Uh, I still take some of my buyer's agents door knocking and I notice that even after 38 years, my right knee still shakes when I go door knocking. <laughs> and I always wear baggier pants when I go door knocking so nobody sees my knee shaking. So none of that's changed. I still am not super comfortable door knocking and yet I know that door knocking brings about a certain result. Do you understand what I mean by that? Like you know there's certain activities that you don't want to do and you know that if you did them you would create a better or more consistent result in your business so let me give you an example uh, my wife and I were going out to a restaurant the other day and there's a few years difference between me and my wife and so we have different tastes in music so we walk into this restaurant and instantly I hear a song from the 60s that brought back all kinds of memories for me has that ever happened to you so what I want you to think about for a minute, you hear a song, it didn't only bring back memories, but it's almost like I forgot that I knew the song because it had been so long since I heard it. Has that ever happened to you? Okay, and it could be anything. It could be a smell. It could be the smell of something cooking that brings you back. But this, and in particular this song, and I relate almost everything to speaking, coaching, and real estate sales because that's my life, right? And especially in real estate sales, and what, made me, what it made me think of is that I went to my very first Mike Ferry seminar in 1988. Okay, so that's 30 years ago this year. I went to my first uh, Tommy Hopkins seminar in 1981, 37 years ago. And these are gentlemen who supposedly taught the world how to be better at selling real estate. What I think about is what I learned back then that I, now listen to what I mean about what this song did to me, it made me realize that in my real estate business, me as a real estate agent, not as a speaker or coach, but me as the guy who has to go out and sell real estate, there are so many things that I've learned over the years to do in my business and I'm not doing them. In other words, I don't need another freaking seminar. I need to sit down and do what I already learned how to do and I already knew how to do and there's still something that's keeping me from doing it. I'm going home. <laughs> that's a brilliant line yeah I'll just keep the results the same way they are now yeah so this is the issue with finishing strong the other issue is the mindset around dates now imagine if I asked you all to pick a date when you are most inspired a date in the year that you typically are most inspired to start again to renew your commitment. And what is that date for most people? It's January 1st, right? You're in December and people say, have you set your goals yet for New Year? Have you set your resolutions? And January comes and you're like out of the gate. And what if every month in your mindset you could say, this is January 1st again? Now let's take that one step further. What if every morning when we woke up we said it's January 1st? I have the chance to start over again. I have a chance to dismiss yesterday and start thinking about how I can make a difference in my business by not beating up on myself over what I didn't do yesterday, but starting afresh saying, wow, I've got from now till December 31st to make a huge difference. Now, when you finish strong, 
Whenever you finish strong, guess what happens? It's an automatic result. You cannot help it. It builds up something called momentum. And what I love about momentum, I know you guys are going to think this is weird, but that's why you didn't pay for today. It's free. Oh, no, no, that's wrong. We charge them. We okay. charge them at the end. Oh, okay. <laughs> but the first three letters of momentum are mom. Now, my mom passed away several years ago, but I can tell you, don't you always, or at least I did, when my mom was in the room, I started thinking, do, do I look okay? Did I say anything wrong? Did anything slip out of my mouth? Have I done everything I've said I would do? Is my room clean? Did I make my bed? Like, that's what came to mind. That's where momentum comes from. Mom told you to do it, damn it, do it. But what happens is you finish strong, you build momentum, and it leads to starting strong in 2019. This is an actual side effect of finishing strong. Now, we talk, I, get you, I gave you just a little foundation that, wow, what if we could set our mindset such that September 1st wasn't September 1st, it was January 1st, or what if we took the labels out completely and every month was January, and every month was an ability for you to start over again? How can we get our mind to work that way? Well, we have so much crap built up in here that it's like fighting through a firewall to get through it to change the outcomes that you've had up till now. Let's let these people come in and sit down. So when you think about that, I want you to start thinking about if you could name one thing, and I'll start with people that I know well, that way I won't be picking on anybody who feels uncomfortable being picked on, but if you think about all the things you've learned to do, so what I want to stop and say, hi, sweetheart, who, who has been in real estate the least amount of time in this room, meaning you're licensed and selling, and you've been in it the least amount of time? So anybody give me an idea? Maria, how long? Uh, just under two years. Okay, that's Maybe. Tiffany. February. February of this year. Anybody less than February? Like you've been in less, that's, February is what, about five months? Yeah. Anybody less than five months? Right? Nannery is maybe new to selling real estate, but certainly not new to the industry, right? So, but when I think about that, you say, okay, Tiffany, I'm gonna take you. You've been in five months. Name one thing to do that you know to do in real estate that you're not currently doing daily. Um, door knocking. Door knocking, okay. <laughs> Everybody, anybody disagree with that? The door knocking could lead you to some business, yes or no? All right, okay, so now uh, let's, let's go somewhere else. Jill, how many years? A dozen. A dozen, 12 years. So that's a lot more than five months. Name one thing other than door knocking that you know to do that you're not currently doing that would help your business. Door knocking is the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Because I too need to do more of that. Okay. Um, you can always make more calls. Okay, calls. All right, calls. Good. That's nice and general, and that's kind of where I want to go, like general, right? Because there's a million ways to door knock. You can circle door knock around your listing. You can farm door knock. You can cold door knock for the sake of finding business. Uh, who else has been in the, who's been in the business more than 12 years, Greg? Yeah. yeah. Give me one thing that you know to do that you haven't one been doing lately. Only? Yeah. <laughs> That's good to hear that there's a lot. Lead follow up, okay. clients. I'm going to take, since, since door knocking and calling are forms of lead generating, you said follow up. Could I do more follow up on people I've talked to in the past? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. So those are three things from people that he's been in 37 years. So five months, 12 years, 37 years. Those are three different things that I'll bet all of you, no matter what experience, have heard of those things, know to do those things, and regularly will go through an entire week without touching any of them. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Not just you, me too. I'm not saying it like I'm the guy up here doing everything. I'm not. If I was, I'd be also producing at a higher level. But because of my experience in coaching agents, I know that the only difference between the highest producing agents, let me tell you what it's not, the highest producing agents and the lowest producing agents, there's no, the difference isn't whether they're male or female, the difference isn't their age, their difference is not how many years they've been in the business or months, the difference is not their educational level, their color of their skin, their sexual preference, their religion, it's none of those things. It's also not how many books they've read. It's none of those. It comes down to one thing. Now, I've been coaching, and I'm, I'm grateful for it for 25 years, but the last three years I've coached more than I did 
In the last three years, I've coached more than I did in the first 22 years of coaching combined. In other words, I've, in, in the last three years, I've quintupled the amount of coaching I do because it became more and more of a passion, and therefore the level of people that I'm coaching keeps going up. Now, as she said in my introduction, most of the people I coach own a real estate office and run a team. So they've got two big jobs in front of them. They've got to grow their real estate office. I have Berkshire Hathaway franchisees. I have Remax franchisees. I have Keller Williams franchisees. I have Next Home, Home Smart, uh, what other come? Exit Realty. All of those different types of real estate companies, I am coaching them on how to build their real estate office and run a successful team. But something that I notice, and I still haven't told you what it is, the only difference between the highest producers and the lowest is just simply one thing, and it is the activities they focus on in a day, period. Can and you, you might say, that? what's that? Can you repeat that please? Yes, the only difference is the activities they focus on in a day. Thank you. Now let me tell you, you might say, oh, well that's simple, I could just go and vote. Well, if it was easy as me saying it, class would be dismissed right now, and you could all leave and go have an amazing last, you know, four and a half months of the year. But it's not that easy. Actually, it's not four and a half months anymore. Now it's four months and a few days. It, the, what's easy, what isn't easy is what you say to yourself on a daily basis. What happens when you get ready to get into bed at night and start analyzing what the day was like? We all do it, ladies and gentlemen, and we all do it in different ways, but it's the same thing. It is that I know that most of you, ma'am, I don't know you at the end of the table with the glasses on your head, but I'm willing to bet that you say things to yourself at night that if someone else said those to you, you'd punch them in the face. Right? And it's something we all do. We allow ourselves to beat up more on ourselves than we would ever allow anybody else to do, and that takes up our energy, and then we wake up with negative energy in the morning. We wake up saying, wow, I'm way behind of where, listen carefully, as young as some of you are in this room, you're probably what, 18? <laughs> yeah, I'm 18, yeah. Well, I was looking behind you, but, but I know. You. Asians tend to age less. So, but what I mean by that is that we, we tend to look at where we are in our lives and say, I thought I'd be so much further along by this time in my life. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the biggest slap in the face. Whether you believe in God or just the universe, it's a slap in the face to the universe, it's a slap in the face to any God that you might believe in. And I'm going to tell you why. Because where you are is exactly where you have to be so that you can continue on this journey to the excellence that you're looking for. Period. I mean, come on. I'm going to be 61 in a few days, and I'm like, wow. There were points in my life. Happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but there, I look at points in my life. I had five years in my 38-year career, five of them, where I did over a million dollars in commission. I don't know where any of that money is. I just remember that I did that. And it's a good thing that I remember, because then when I go, gosh, sometimes I look at my business and say, I suck right, at what I'm doing, and then I realized, no, I don't suck, I've just changed my focus. I don't focus as much. I mean, there were years when I used to sell 140 houses a year right here in Fremont, right? And 140 houses a year at $500,000 average sale price, that was a pretty good year, right? But the idea was that was what my focus was. Now I look at my focus, I say, well, there's more focus on speaking and coaching and traveling with my wife and doing more fun things, so what happens to your production? It goes down. What I want to ask you is if production is what you're concerned about, are you actually focused on it? And I want you to learn to ask yourself this question. Every morning when you wake up, ask yourself, what has my attention? I want you to write that question down because I want you to ask yourself that every morning when you wake up and you put your feet on the ground, you say, what has my attention? Because you all have something going on in your life. Everybody does. It's a fact of life. It's called, oh, let me tell you, it's called life. <laughs> your mother is ill. Your friend got sick. Somebody got in a rear-end accident. Something more tragic might have happened. And I don't even like mentioning them because they bring negativity in the room, but there are things that happen. I always say people are right smack in the middle of a tragedy or trial in their life, or they're just coming out of one or just going in one. That's it. 
It's like what they say about termites in California, right? They say there's only two kinds of homes as it relates to termites in California, those that have termites and those that will have termites, right? It's the same thing with tragedies, trials, and tribulations. You're either in one, just on your way out of one, or about to walk into one, and you just never know. It's around the corner, and it's, it's, this is what I say about that. How many of you believe that you have ever set humongous goals, dreams for yourself? Really big ones, like scary ones. Raise your hand. Okay, now, let me ask you to, to consider, is it possible that I've set mediocre dreams for myself? No judgment on the word, but what does that mean? Okay, so when did you pass your real estate test? In November. November. Do you remember hearing that you passed? Now, what, how do they do it now? It's been so long, because when I passed my test, it took about a month and a guy rode up on a pony and said, here's your passing. Do you hear it right then? Yeah, when I exited, they're like, you passed, but they don't give you the score. Okay, so you passed. Mm -hmm. did, did you walk out and want to call someone immediately and celebrate? I did call someone, yeah. Ooh. My husband. Your husband. And okay. then my mom and then my dad. And you said, oh my gosh, I passed. Yeah, I'm like, I don't have to do this again. Okay, now, Maria, <laughs> you've been a couple years. Do you remember the feeling of when you passed the test? Yeah. Who else has been in like they can, you can actually remember when you passed the test? Okay. Yeah. And Frank, how many years ago was it? Uh, 30 years ago. Okay. And do you remember the feeling like when you heard you passed? Because back then we had to wait. Yeah. Right? You had to wait for the freaking letter in the mail and crawl to yeah, your house. Yeah, you asked for firing still not knowing did you pass or yeah, not. Yeah, exactly. He said, oh, I, I think they cashed my check. Well, that didn't mean anything. Yeah. <laughs> the government does that all the time. Right. So, what I realized is that when I, ca when I passed, and, and it may be different for Tiffany over here, but when I passed, it was like I was in Cal State Hayward, which is today Cal State East Bay, studying to get my biology degree so I could go to dental school. All right, But the whole family was in real estate, 75 relatives in real estate at the time in 1980. But I want you to imagine that this is my passing grade right here. I still went, oh my gosh, I passed, and I'm going to be so amazing at this. Right? I don't think anybody grabs their license and says, oh my gosh, I passed. I'm going to be so average at this. No one does that. You don't go get your real estate license. You don't do anything in your life in your original intention to set out to do it in mediocrity. I don't think anyone does. I think when we get excited and when we see something out there, we go, I'm going to kill it. And then what causes mediocrity to come in is the constant hitting up against a wall, failures, people rejecting you, all of that starts to beat down on the ability for you to continue to see yourself being amazing versus being average. All right? I like to say this, that mediocrity is like getting into bed in your room on a warm evening. And you've got the blankets over you because you like having blankets over you, not because it's cold. And then you realize it's too warm for the blankets, so you get up and open the window, and a breeze comes through and it feels good. So you snuggle up in your blankets, and that comfort is mediocrity. That comfort of knowing that there's a breeze and you can stay cuddled up in your blankets, that's what mediocrity is. Mediocrity is what's comfortable. Because all of the amazing things that happen in your life always happen when you're uncomfortable. Nothing amazing happens in your comfort zone. See, here's the problem with human beings. And I think, I've looked around the room, I think we all all human beings in here. So, human beings love And I'm writing this slowly because it's going to show you how frustrated you get just waiting for me to write what I should have just said. <laughs> Human beings love immediate gratification. How do you think I know that? Well, I know it from my own experience of me. But I also know, look at the network marketing industry. Between 2007 and 2011, 
the number of people who joined into the network market industry quintupled, went up by almost five times. Over 200 million more people into network marketing as a quote unquote side hustle. You all know what side hustle means? Something else to do besides what I do to make extra money. And almost 91% of them failed to do what they dreamed of doing because of this love for immediate gratification. What is that? I just worked. Give me my damn money. <laughs> right? Does that work in real estate or network marketing? No. You have to build, right? You have to build. But it, and that's why I said here, look what I said here. If you, if you finish strong, what happens? You end up, you can't even, you can't stop it if you want to. It starts something amazing happening between January and April. One of the one of the agents I've known the longest in my life is at a re, at a an office in Fremont. It used to be Remax. It's not now. And he regularly every year between September first and December thirty first knocks on ten thousand doors. Wow. Every year, and then guess what happens? He's always the top listing agent in our board from January first to April first. Why? Because he committed to activities between then and then between September 1st and December 31st. But he doesn't expect this. What he's looking for is not immediate gratification, but he's looking for permanent gratification. Okay? People like to call it delayed gratification. Do you want immediate or delayed? And I'm gonna tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that delayed gratification ends up being bigger, more fun, more uncomfortable, and greater results. That, and it brings you to more permanent gratification. It's true in almost everything anybody does. The more immediate the gratification, the less dependent you can be on it in the future. Okay? You can quickly run over to McDonald's, put in your application, get a job doing the fries, and at the end of the week, you'll get your paycheck. All right? I used to talk to a buddy of mine. He says, look, all I want to do is have enough money coming in so that if I felt like I had to have a job, I could still do the fry center over at McDonald's and still live a comfortable life. And I said, well, why did you pick doing fries at McDonald's? He goes, have you tasted their fries? <laughs> right? But he was saying, even back then when we were talking about it, people were getting paid three eighty-five dollars an hour. Now I think it's some ridiculous number like what? Isn't it like 10 or 12 bucks an hour is the minimum wage? I think it's going up to 17. Is it? Yeah, I, don't, I want you all ignoring that because that sounds like way too much. But I want you to think about this, and this is where I'm taking all of this: is that discomfort, your discomfort, is based on your behavioral style. I don't have enough time in an hour class or two hour class to work on your behavioral styles. But there's four major behavioral styles. I'm going to suggest a couple of books that I'd like you to read, and I'm going to tell you this that those behavioral styles will dictate what's comfortable for you and what's not. And people will tell you, people that think they know behavioral styles, but I will tell you that the discomfort of lead generation, any type of prospecting, listen, my voice is going to go up and get louder because I want you to hear it. And I'm not really yelling at you. I'm sort of yelling at myself because it's reminding me that when I leave here, I'm going to go back to lead generating again, is that the number one thing about lead generation is all four behavioral styles don't like it. Natural. <laughs> Naturally is here, not here. When you see people excelling at, at lead generation, it's because they made an intellectual choice that in disregard of the discomfort, I will continue to do it and I will get the results. I'll give you an example. I want you to think of the most analytical person you know, the bean counter, the numbers person, the detail guy. The guy that when you say, hey, where do you live? He doesn't just say, oh, I live in Pleasanton. He says, I live in Pleasanton. It's about 32 miles from here. You have to get off of 680 at Bernal. And when you go to, that's the person I'm talking about. The one who makes you want to poke yourself in the eye when they're talking about detail like that. <laughs> that you take one of those people who hates not venturing. It's uncomfortable to venture into something <clears throat> until they've analyzed the results ahead of time. And you get a person like that to every morning walk into a private room, shut the door, and get on the phone for three hours straight. Calling, calling, calling. Dorothy, you know him. His name was Janelle, Brett Janelle. And this guy is a super high analyst guy, super big producer, Australian guy, 
but very, very, very detail oriented. If you look up the word anal in the dictionary, there's a picture of it. <laughs> but what about Brett Janelle is every morning, five days a week, in the room, shut the door, making his three hours of phone call. Not because he likes phone calls. In fact, if you ask him, he'll tell you he hates it. But it's the discomfort of doing something that he does not like doing that brings him the results that he's looking for. Right? Now, if a guy like Brett Chanel can do it, he doesn't do it out of natural ability, which is here, your gut. He does it because he made an intellectual choice by reading the statistics that people who do this succeed highly in selling houses. Period. I freaking hate door knocking. My knee still shakes. I'm not lying. But I know if I knock on 100 doors, I'll probably get three appointments. I know that. Statistically, for me, that's what I've had. I can't say that that statistic would work for you because I don't know what you'll say when they open the door. I had one of my agents when I was managing an office in 1994. He said, Rick, I listened to you and the training guy in the office. His name was Rusty, and you guys keep telling me to door knock. I knocked on 1,000 doors, and I've got one appointment. I'm like, what? What are you saying? Right? Immediately, I said, if you knocked on a thousand doors, if you're truly not lying and you got no appointments, then it all has to do with co what's coming out of your mouth. So I had him stand outside of my office door and I shut the door and I said, knock on my door as if it's my house. He knocks on the door. I open the door. He goes, hi, you're not thinking of selling, are you? <laughs> I slammed the door in his face. Wouldn't that be what anybody did? How negative of a way to ask a question, right? So I grabbed him in. I said, sit down. Where did you hear anybody tell you to say that? He goes, I didn't. He goes, but it's the most comfortable thing I could have said. That's like when you're dialing and making your calls. That's like the same thing as you go, please don't answer. Please don't answer. Please don't answer. <laughs> it's the same thing. Right? Have you caught yourself doing I still catch myself doing that. I'll be calling my own database, people that know me. Please don't answer, please don't answer. What? <laughs> what if you turned all of that around? Right? There was a girl that worked for me in the same office that I was managing. Um, and she lead generating. You know there's a twisted mind when they love lead generating, right? She used to love door knocking. She was five foot two. <coughs> blonde. And she, she, we were like, a bunch of us were so amazed at her results from door knocking that we actually got in the car and just drove down the street slowly watching her door knock. We told her we were going to do it. And she'd knock on the door. A big guy would come and answer the door. And she'd go, hi, I'm not selling anything. <laughs> like that. And I said, if I did that, the guy would go. Ch -ch. <laughs> <laughs> a five foot ten Arab with a beard. I mean, I was, I'm sure I would have been dead. But a cute little five foot point, five foot two blonde, like they were so endeared by it. She'd leave voicemails on cold calls and they'd call her back. <laughs> like we had never heard of this, right? But she gets about six months into the business and things are starting to happen and all these leads that she was bringing in are starting to get into transactions. She comes into my office crying one day and says, oh my gosh, you didn't warn me. I said, what didn't I warn you? Now this, this is a girl I'm looking at like, wow, you're like the best lead generator in the office. And she says, you didn't tell me that these people who love me at their door turn into schmucks and jackasses during the transaction. <laughs> Literally within two weeks of that conversation, she wanted to get out of real estate. I didn't want to lose her because of her lead generation ability. I took her down the hallway. I introduced her to a husband and wife team in my office. I said, how would you guys like the best lead generator in the office to work with you? And they're like, yeah, how do we do that? And I sat down and coached them. She started coming in four days a week, Monday through Thursday, three hours a day to lead generate. Count it. That's 12 hours a week. In her first full year, 12 hours a week, she made $96,000. This is in the mid-90s. All on referral fees. She said, I want nothing to do with the transaction. I'll bring you the people. They're going to love me. You guys can take care of the end when they turn ugly. I get my check at the end. Well, I'm a <laughs> 96 grand, which means she brought almost 400 grand in business to the team. Do you get that? Mm -hmm. But she was so happy. She worked 12 hours a week. Do the math. 12 hours a week, she worked 50 weeks a year, two weeks off. She continued doing that for a couple of years, ended up retiring and opening up a secondhand clothing shop in Tracy. She was living in Fremont for a while. But when you look back at that, the thing that was most uncomfortable for all of us was most comfortable for her and the thing that's easy for us. How many of you would sign up for the leads and you'll handle the transaction? Yeah, give me the leads. I got the transaction, right? <clears throat> what I'm saying is it takes all kinds. 
but all kinds. What was uncomfortable for her? The transaction. Could she have made more if she was comfortable with the transaction? Yes. Yeah. Get it? Now you're thinking, I, I'd rather have her knack for lead generating. Of course you would. But you can't pull your brain out and put hers in there. If, I, if that was true, I would have done that a long time ago. So what is it about your unhappiness with you and where you are that's keeping you from doing the things that will allow you to say, look in the mirror at yourself and say, I actually did what I said I would do. So give you one more analogy. I want to be respectful of the time. Um, how many of you are familiar with donuts at a deep level? Like you really know donuts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sir. I'm sorry. What's your name? Romero. What? Romero. Romero, you do know donuts well. You love donuts. I love donuts. Okay, good. Because I'm looking for those people who like often are driving down the road and see donut shops. Because I'm in different cities every day, all over the United States and Canada, and you see the word donuts everywhere. Yeah. You know, and the first time that I was in a Starbucks and I saw them tearing open plastic to take donuts out of it, I said, I'll never eat a donut here again, right? <laughs> All these different things about donuts. And I have a particular favorite. It's called a glazed twist. And it's a twist with like, looks like a braid and it has a little cinnamon running through it and lots of icing on top. So that's my favorite. I am today at about 172 pounds. When I used to love and eat donuts, I usually ran around 210 pounds. That was the majority of my life. Do you think I can continue to eat donuts and keep a 172 pound body? No. Way. no. So I had to allow myself that I could have a reward donut about once a quarter. Okay? But a reward donut wasn't one donut. It was a reward at that time. And I could stuff as many donuts into those 10 minutes as possible. <laughs> <laughs> you guys like the idea? You're like, I can subscribe to that program. Once a quarter, eat as many donuts as you can. So I, re I remember, because there's a donut place in Fremont, I grew up in Fremont, that I've been going to since I was literally eight years old. And it's called Lloyd's Donuts, and it's on Maori, right at the corner of Blake out. And it's still there. It's not owned by the same family, but it's still there, and they still make amazing donuts, right? The idea that I'm telling you behind this is not eating donuts is uncomfortable for me. Driving by donut shops all the time, it makes me, we start doing this thing about, I deserve a donut. Have you ever done that? I deserve this. I've been working so hard. We always tell ourselves that we deserve the one thing that will do us the most damage, don't we? I deserve this day off. I've been working my butt off. You haven't made any damn money. You don't deserve a day off. You deserve a slap upside the head, right? But yet we do this. We rationalize to ourselves. It's the same thing we do with our lead generation activity. How many of you said, today's the day I'm going into the office and I'm going to get a damn lead? Next thing you know, you're crawling into bed, and you realize, God, I never got that lead. Anyone besides me? Oh, just five of us. The rest of you are liars. So <laughs> why do I say that? I say that because we always start out the day with these great intentions of what will happen. So I'm going to wrap this up and stop talking about mindset now and actually take you into activities and things that we can do that will change that. The biggest coaching clients, I, I at one point, I don't coach her anymore, but I used to coach a, a lady uh, and her first name is Jacqueline. And her, she was the number one real estate agent in the entire state of Georgia. She had 52 people on her team, closing about $10 million in commissions a year. $10 million in commissions, not volume. And she had 52 people on her team. She was mostly focused on new home development. She was with Remax. When I started coaching her, she had eight kids. It was a combined family, her and her husband. He was in the real estate, he was a developer, and um, they, they struggled having eight kids from 21 years old down to six months old. Okay? That's a, don't you think that's a big spread? Big spread, right? Now, we had set that we were going to do certain things. So I asked her, when do you work out? Because, you know, I, we work on these Zoom. Zoom, are you familiar with Zoom? It's a video conferencing program. So I could see her. She looked like she was in amazing shape for a woman who had eight kids. And her husband would get on. He looked like he was, I said, you guys must work out. When do you do it? And she, she said, oh, I do it 7 a.m., Monday through Friday. I go, okay, cool. So I said, all right, I want you. Now listen carefully to what I did. Because aren't we all working on our mindset, yes or no? Yeah, we're working on our mindset to get the things done we know we must do. 
So I said, all right, I want you to do me a favor and set your iPhone from the minute your feet hit the ground in the morning on 30 minute timer. Every time it goes off, how often is it gonna go off? 30 minutes. Every 30 minutes, you're gonna get a sheet of paper and write down what you did those last 30 minutes. Okay? And I want you to do that for seven days in a row. Now for most of you, you'd get to about an hour and a half from now and you'd say, screw it, I don't wanna do it anymore, <laughs> right? But to do that, where you're carrying around a piece of paper, and every time your 30-minute alarm goes off, every 30 minutes, all day, every day, seven days in a row. Now, all of my coaching clients have to do that. They have to do it at least once for seven days. Now, I take those seven sheets. Remember, why do people not do things? Because they're afraid they're going to get in trouble. But if you warn them that this isn't about getting you in trouble, it's about getting reality about what gets done versus what you hope gets done. Let me repeat that. It's about seeing what really gets done versus what you were hoping would get done. She gives me her seven days and I compare it to her calendar. I'm only gonna use the workout thing right now because that will relate to a lot of us. We all kind of hope to work out. I looked five days a week, she committed to working out at 7 a.m. I looked at her seven days, she worked out once at 7 a.m. Once out of the five days she chose to. So I said, hey, Jack, listen, what happened? She goes, what happened on what? I said, five days at 7 a.m. I go, I got from 7 to 7.30 on four of those days, K-E, and from 7.30 to 8, K-E, and from 8 to 8.30, K-E. What the heck is K-E? And she goes, oh, sorry, I meant to write that out for you. That means kid emergency. <laughs> She goes, with eight kids, I go, I know, with eight kids, you've got a lot of kid emergency. Now, what do we do then? Do we look at it and say, you've got to stop having kid emergencies? Or do we say, maybe we should be moving the time that you have set aside for workout to another time in the day? I said, who handles kid emergencies in the evening? She said, my husband. I said, how would you feel about working out at 7 p.m. Monday through Friday instead of 7 a.m.? She goes, oh, I never thought of that. And I said, now think about this. Super intelligent woman didn't think about moving the time, but we all do that because this is the way we always did it. Instead of saying, instead of just looking straight ahead, what if I start looking around for other solutions? I start tapping people on the shoulder and I say, hey, Romero, what have you experienced when you couldn't get your workout in? Like I start talking to other people because besides lead generating, the next thing no one likes at doing at all this is the number one problem in our entire society, is no one of any behavioral style likes asking for help. Whether you know behavior styles or not, ladies and gentlemen, all four behavioral styles, the D's, the I's, the S's, the C's, or whatever behavioral style you do, they do not, these don't like doing it because they feel like they're going to end up doing it anyway because you'll suck at doing it. The eyes don't like it because they like to love people and be loved and they're afraid if they ask you for help, you won't love them as much. The S's want to help and support other people but don't want to be supported. And the C's are worried that you'll break, you know, that you won't understand the detail of getting it done. So why should I bother asking you? All four behavioral styles do not like asking for help or support. We moved it to 7 p.m. She did the seven days of 30 minutes again for us. She missed one workout. One. Now, these are just one week pictures of what happens. But you have to start remembering that your day goes from what I call eyes open or wake up. But see, we don't just talk to our people about what happens when you wake up. We find out when you wake up, do you lie in bed and, look, and start looking at your phone? Or do your feet get down on the ground right away? My wife's entire business is on her phone. So when she wakes up, she just picks up her phone and starts working from bed. Unless she has an actual webinar that she has to get up and brush her hair to look good for the webinar. But you, I have to find out when I'm coaching somebody, do you start to see the detail? And when I ask you about the detail is you don't take, you take more care of your clients and detail for every part of the transaction than you do about the thing that will bring you the most in life, which is you taking care of you and understanding your life and your habits. I very well understand my habit around donuts. Okay, I understand my habit about red meat. I can no longer have a habit around red meat because of my age and my heritage, 
my background, my genetic background doesn't allow me to do that anymore or I'll die young and I don't want to die young. So I start waking up, I start paying attention to every activity. What time did I wake up? How many times did I hit snooze? How many, am I quickly out of bed? Am I energetic? Should I go to bed earlier so that when, I, when my alarm goes off, I can jump right out of bed? In the past about year and a half, I set my alarm for the last possible minute so that I don't snooze. When it goes off, I know I must jump up, like I'm done, because I have to do something five minutes from now. You get it? So like today, I had my first coaching call at 6. I was out of bed at 5.55, right? I don't have room to snooze. Snoozes are nine minutes. <laughs> I would have been late, right? So I force myself into habits that are uncomfortable yet produce greater results. You get what I'm saying? How many of you like me? You could just sleep all day, every day, right? You couldn't? I can. Just give me some blankets, an air conditioner, I'm all good, right? So, <laughs> so wake up. Then what happens from then? And what happens from then? If you look at my calendar, every bit of even driving from my home, my office is only in Fremont, but my home is in Pleasant Hill, my drive time for today was 90 minutes. It only took me about an hour, but I knew that because I want to build in time to make my calls, get myself an iced tea, you know, then come in and be here early. And I was still here by 11, 11, 05, 11, 10. I've got that all built in. Every part, ladies and gentlemen, of your day, if you're going to have a great end of the year, is going to come from you being on purpose. Not your day running you, but you running your day. Now, I'm going to do all of you a little act of random kindness uh i will whoever has your email address if you're my people i have your email address if you're not nannery probably does and i'm going to send you a couple of things by email to to help you support that form that i was telling you about where you keep track of every half hour that's called a dsh form and i'm not going to write this out but that stands you can daily success habits on the left side of the form you with me? I haven't allowed you to wake up or fall asleep, right? <laughs> On the left side of the form is slots every half hour where you set your alarm and you keep track of what you do every half hour. On the right side of the form is activities like emails, calling clients, setting appointments, showing homes, doing open houses, and they give you points for that. If you can get to 61 points in a day, five days a week, Anybody who gets to 61 points in a day, five days a week, and does it on a regular basis, we usually sell between 50 and 60 homes a year. Wow. Okay? And that's on a minimum side. In areas where there's more production than the average sale price is lower, that's usually between 75 and 100 deals a year. We have a much higher average sale price and less transactions to choose from here. So as we coach people around, we see that. When we see that people are getting 61 points on a regular basis and not having a lot of closed sales, then we have to analyze whether or not they're lying or sort of fudging about what the activity was and did they complete it. A lot of people will say, oh, look, I wrote 15 handwritten notes today, so I get 15 points. One point for each handwritten note, right? Well, if you only write handwritten notes, are you going to sell 70 houses a year? No. Well, wouldn't that require some follow-up? You know, we used to say mail, phone, mail. Okay, this is an old trick in real estate that still works. I'm going to mail you something, then I'm going to call you up and see if you got it, and then I'm going to talk to you when I, when I do that. Hey, I want to make sure you got that note I sent you in the mail. Yeah, sure did, Rick Howard thing. And then I mail you a note saying, hey, it was great catching up with you on the phone. Like mail, phone, mail, and then the reverse of that is phone, mail, phone. I'm not even supposed to tell you guys these ideas. Phone mail, phone is something. <laughs> hey, just checking in on you. I want to let you know I'm going to drop something in the mail. Make sure you keep an eye out for it. It's got some good stuff in it. That's the phone. Then I mail what I said I'd mail. Then I call them back. Hey, did you get what I sent you? Isn't that amazing stuff? Right? So that's a way of what? Not only keeping on top of your people, but you just did three touches in a very short time on your individual. This individual goes to work three days later and someone says, hey, my daughter's buying a house. Do you know anybody who might want to be able to sell her a house? What is on their mind? You, right? These are beautiful things that you can do. But my point, ladies and gentlemen, is that if you're keeping track of what your activities are and you are then keeping track of what lead generation activities and you give yourself points, you will create a difference. Now, I'm going to send you one other thing. We only do this and this with people who have turned in a perfect week. What a perfect week is, and I'm going to send you this, it's an Excel spreadsheet with instructions. Listen carefully. I'm going fast now. 
to show you how to design your perfect week. We call it perfect week, but it is actually an imperfect week. And we're not looking at you to be right, wrong, good, or bad. You do this, you formulate that week as ideally what you'd like your week to look like. When will you get up? When will you go to sleep? When will you work? Now listen, I want you to think about this carefully. Most people take their calendar as lightly as they take their diet and nutrition. And what I mean by that is if you start to see your, when I see people and they'll go, yeah, I got 30 minutes right here for lunch. I go, stop right there. Is your lunch in your left pocket? And they go, what do you mean? I go, where do you account for driving to get the lunch, paying for it, or preparing it, cooking it, right? The only way you can really truly do lunch in 30 minutes is if you have to walk down from your office to a refrigerator, pull it out, and sit down and eat it. And if you do that, that means somewhere else in your day, I should see prep time for my food. And what we don't do is we don't look seriously. My sister-in-law, my wife's sister, Erin, the most disciplined person I've ever met, two hours every other day in food prep at her house. Two hours every other day in her schedule. We'll say, hey, come on over, spend the night at our house. We haven't visited in a while because she only lives 10 minutes away, right? And she'll go, sorry, it's food prep night, right? Gets up every single morning and works out for two hours. Every single morning, seven days a week. Is she fit? Yes. Very. Can she outrun me? Yes, very. Right? <laughs> we, go, we go like walking and she'll take off up the hill. I go, see you on the other side. You know, what are you going to do? Very, very disciplined. But what I say about that is we cannot be casual. Look, listen to this one saying, casualness leads to casualties. All right, the more casual you are, the quicker you die in the business. So what I want you to think about is what if I was super serious about my calendar? I knew right when everything happened, all right? And I'm talking about how much time does it take me to get ready, all right? I'm married now to a woman who is in the anti-aging industry, all right? <laughs> all about anti-aging on the inside and on the outside. Well, now I have a regime my whole life. It was like seven minutes from shower to out the door, right? Now I got to put stuff on my face, take my supplements. I got like all these regimes I have. Now I have a lot more time. I know now that from the minute I walk into the bathroom till the minute I walk out the door is 37 minutes. And that's still relatively short compared to a lot of people. And that's thanks God to gel, right? <laughs> you just put it in and it stays down. So, but what I'm saying is that these are different things that you have to start to calculate if you want your day to go the way it is. I like dressing up. I love it. I don't dress up for you. I like it for me. So I've got to account for that, right? I always say when I'm having a really good year, I'm going to buy some nice suits. That way, when the year is horrible, I can say, oh, I already got the nice suits. But all I'm saying is it's all about preparation and getting ready and getting ready and getting ready. If you don't allow yourself the time. Now, when you get this form, it's going to have instructions with it on how to prepare your perfect week. Remember, sleep time, eat time, prepare time, workout time, date night, one-on-one -on -one with your children, uh, date night maybe with technology, date night without technology, like phones, no phones. All those things have to be accounted for. Make sure that you separate out lead generation and lead follow-up. They are two different activities. Most people, when they're doing their lead generation, will actually be caught. Like if I hovered over your office, I usually catch you saying you're doing lead generation, but you're actually already talking to people that you've already talked to before about buying or selling, and that's called lead follow-up. That is why, because again, it's more comfortable talking to people you've already talked to than the discomfort of talking to people you haven't spoken to. Are you with me? Okay, I know I'm doing that fast, but I really want you to get this. So along with that, I'll send you a few other things like some scripts that work and a couple other things. It'll be a nice hefty email with a lot of attachments if you'll read them. They'll really help you. Last thing that's going to be in there is a little 27-page e-booklet called 86-50-1. This is the name of the book. Okay, do you see that? The name of the book is Numbers. What it stands for is doing, watch this, 86 transactions a year working with the top 50 people in your database one hour a day. You get that? And this has been proven, tried. It's being used all over the U.S. and Canada by agents from all different companies. And I want to remind you, what company you work for doesn't freaking matter. Because wherever you go, there you are. I hear people all the time, I'm leaving this company. I suck at selling here, so it must be the company. And they go to another company, and surprise, they realize I'm still here. I'm me, still here. And I'm still not doing the things I need to be doing. So they, this booklet is so popular because it crosses Nobody thinks about company. They just think about my 50 top people. Who are they? 
who are the top 50 people in my database that have sent me referrals or would like to if I coach them on it. They love me. They want to tell the world about me. You get it? This, is, this booklet will be in your email also. I really want you to read this and start focusing on it. But there will be also some scripts that you can use in re-communicating with people. I'll also attach, you need to remind me this, an apology script. This is what I use when I'm calling people that I haven't reached out to in a long time and I feel bad about it. Because, I mean, obviously, wouldn't it be great to say, dude, I haven't heard from you in ages. What the heck's wrong with you? Well, they're not going to like that, right? But you're the realtor, so it's your fault that you haven't reached out. So I like to use an apology script. And an apology script is not used to ask for business. It's to reconnect and reignite that old relationship that you had. And hopefully, when you talk to them, you won't find out that they already moved without using all right, because that's painful when it happens. So, all right, so that's that. I want to end with this. I want to find out a couple of things that you may have gotten from today. How many of you are familiar with the term called aha? Like you got an aha. You know what it is? Aha moment. Yes, an aha moment. What does that mean to you? What's your first name? Lynn. Lynn, what does that mean to you, aha moment? I'm realizing that that's the opportunity we missed for. Great, great. Does everybody get an aha? So what if it's a really big aha? What if we called it a jihad? <laughs> just kidding all right <laughs> so i'd like to hear some ahas before we close out because i've got one more two more statements so who had an aha that they could share with me today since we've been here together all in the last uh 45 minutes yes first name you're yeah. gabby right yes well my aha moment is that i realize i know what's wrong but i'm not doing right and that's being organized. Okay. So that was my big aha moment right now that, you know, that um, 30 minutes a day thing and yes. all that would really help me. Good. Organized. Good. Now, I want to help you with your language. Are you okay if I coach you in front of everybody real quick? Sure. Okay. So she used two terms just then when she described that. She used the term wrong and bad. Okay. These are words of judgment. There's two others. There's good and right. Okay, so I want you to get these out of your language completely because these are all four words of judgment, good, bad, right, and wrong. What you want to use, Gabby, is, is it working for me, right? Now it's not good, bad, right, or wrong. You can say, was it effective? Did what I do work for me to get me more business? We're all in this to sell houses, right? Because that's how we get our money, and then we take our money, and we do our things with it. What do we want to do with the money? We want to fund our fund. Okay, that's what we do with our money. We fund the fun things we do. Sure, we all pay our bills first, but then after we pay our bills, we can fund our fun. So it's not good, bad, right, or wrong. It's just going to say all the things I've been doing, this is me, Gabby, talking to myself in the mirror, are not effective. They're not working for where I want to end up. So I'm going to start doing things that will work, that will get me to where I want to go. Now I don't have to judge myself by saying I suck or I'm good or I'm bad or I'm right or wrong. Okay, good for you. Thank you very much. One other aha. Who else got? Yes, your first name? Heather. Heather, yes. Uh, scanning social media, what to pick and what not to pick, what's going to work for your business or not. Okay. I'm so, learning it as I'm going. All right. So you scan social media a lot? Yes. Would you say you're addicted? Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks for your honesty. <laughs> but I get I mean, business that way, too. What's that? I get business that way. No, no, no. I do. Yes. I get that. Yes. But what I tell people is to understand on that that's very good is what we call the red light. Excuse me, red time and green time. Okay? All scanning of social media should be in red time. Okay? Even if you do get business from it, but that, sh that should be coming in your red time. So red time is before 9 a.m. and after 8 p.m. Okay? Green time is, and it doesn't have to be that big a green time, meaning like you could say green time is 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Okay, and what does green time mean? It means that there's really during green time no time where you couldn't pick up the phone and call a client or call somebody, right? So we say leave your green time for that. But do you actually, does anybody actually do, you know, like 11 or 12 hours of green time? No. So do a couple solid hours of good green time work. And then if you've done that, the actual phone calls, the actual handwritten notes in your green time to people, then you go, okay, I've already done my good green time work. I'll go ahead and spend some time scanning for business. Right. And what's right? working, too, that I noticed for me, mm -hmm. when they have a birthday, I actually call them and I don't say it on Facebook. Good for you. Yeah. I'm going to ask you to do both. Get a big bit emoji 
post a bitmoji happy birthday on their Facebook page and then pick up the phone and call them. A lot of people will see me on Facebook and not click about. My entire Facebook page is public and if you click about on my name, you'll see my name, my address, my cell phone, my email address, it's all there. People on Facebook message, you're really trying to get a hold of you. I'm like, how hard did you try, dude? <laughs> like really? Like everything is there in public. So that's what I'm saying. When you're doing it, people call me all the time and say, hey, this guy out here has a referral for Fremont, California. And I'll reach out. I don't see his number on Facebook or anything. Then guess what I'll do? I'll go to the website of the company they're with, and boom, there's their mobile number. And everybody's trying to get a hold of them on Facebook. I'm calling them on his cell phone. My name's Rick. I've been selling real estate in this area for 38 years. I will do anything to get a referral, right? It's all about that. When you do, remember, don't be a Facebook uh, like freak that they call it. In other words, if you're going to really scan, then make comments of five words or more. Don't just like or love a comment, all right? Five words or more tells Facebook that you are involved and it brings more activity to your Facebook page. Do you guys know that? That's an algorithm in Facebook. In other words, if you just like, 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 nothing happens. But if you start putting comments of five words or more on other people's posts, you'll start getting more activity on your page. Okay. One other aha before I close out. One more. Come on. Don't be shy. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. If it's not on your schedule, it doesn't exist. Very good. So it's, I didn't say those exact words, but that's exactly what we're talking about. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people put stuff on their schedule and it doesn't get done, right? <laughs> that's the point. It is, yes, it's got to get on my schedule and I've got to commit to doing it. But that's why we have the perfect week so that you finish what your week would look like and then you do those seven days of that 30 minutes. Then we can see what truly got done versus what you said would and when. Like you may have done lead generation and you got it done over here at three to four, but in your, in your uh, perfect week, it said I was going to do it between 10 and 11. All good. You still did it. We call that uh, if you must erase, right? I got to erase this out of my schedule over here from 10 to 11 because something else came up. Then you must replace. Okay. So when you have that set week, perfect time, right? I said 10 to 11, I'm going to lead generate. But guess what? Somebody that I lead generated the other day called me and said they need to come over and list my house from 10 to 11. So now I erase it and then I replace it down here. I don't say, oh, I got a listing appointment, so I don't need to lead generate today. That's when the bad habits start going downhill again, right? It's the consistency that brings you the business. That's why most of my clients now, and they say, Rick, between now and our next call, I'm going to get three listings. I go, I don't want to hear that. I said, from now to our next call, I want to hear what activities you will do. The results will come. So I want you tracking your activities, not saying I'll come and get three listings. Because you may already have three listings in your back pocket that aren't signed yet, and I don't even know. You get it? So just tell me what activities you do. Commit to the activities. It's a good aha. Thank you. All right. So uh, here's how I want to close out. Typically, when I start a class, I say, look, right now when I'm starting the class, I don't know you all very well. But I can tell you, I believe more in your potential than you do in your potential because I know what's possible. What I've seen people do, come out of the darkness into the light, it's been incredible. I took a lady going through divorce, sad, literally on, had actually con considered suicide. Today she owns three real estate offices. I coached her when she was opening her first. Now she owns three real estate offices. She's super successful. Just the only thing that changed was her mindset about the activity she focuses on and magic happened. So it doesn't matter where you are in your life. Your life consists of four things. Your relationships, your physical well-being, your spiritual being, and, of course, your work. It's going to be tough to have balance in all four, but that's where the fun of discomfort comes from, is getting to where you have balance in all four sides. So why I said that is at the end of it, even though it's only an hour and ten minutes or so, I believe that you now know what's possible for you. So thank you very much for listening. All right, I'm thirsty. <laughs> okay.